you know, your listeners that are listening to this and you aren't sober yet or not in the process of getting sober and, or even just, you know, there's that recreational use, then there's the abuse and then there's the addiction. So even if you're in recreational use, please go get fentanyl strips to test your drugs to make sure there isn't fentanyl in there. Because like you said, that poor kid, you know, second time buying drugs, you know, experimenting with it and they're gone. Ken Seeley, thank you for joining us on Knocking Doors Down. We appreciate your time, good sir. Hey, thank you for having me. Your view wins, Ken. (laughs) Your view wins. (laughs) For those that are listening, yeah, those that are listening to the audio only, Ken lives in uh, Hawaii and he's got the backdrop. I'm guessing that's your backyard. That is just the shittiest view, Ken. (laughs) It's horrible, right? You want to know what I'm looking at? I'm looking at uh, almond orchards. I see. I see a crow. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, Ken, uh, you know, for people that may not know, you're an uh, interventionist, um, you know, you're authored a great book, Face It and Fix It, a uh, three-step plan to uh, breaking free from denial and discover the life you deserve. We definitely want to get into that. Also, your time on A&E with uh, intervention. But uh, I always like to know a little bit more uh, but the backstory of our guest. I mean, you acknowledge it, you know. Seeing the man I'm talking to today, I couldn't believe that you were an addict of uh, and crystal meth. It's just wow, what a transformation! Yeah, I did crystal meth every day for like three to four years, and um, couldn't stop. I mean, it was just like I always felt like I was going to miss something if I stopped. You ever have that feeling, like, oh my god, if I if I go to sleep, I'm going to miss this, and you know, whatever this is. <laughs> You know, I want to miss this and uh, but just kept going and go, 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 go until finally I just I mean, I got fired from my job and that was it. What were you doing at the time? Oh, my God, that's even better. I was doing medical billing for a treatment center. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of took a left turn there. (laughs) Yeah, right. I was doing all the insurance billing and I was, you know. July 14th, 1989, I, you know, people would come in and they'd have their copay and I'd be collecting their copay and then, okay, go in and do your admissions department now. And they would go in there and they were like, do you want to go to treatment? And I, when I got fired, I was like treatment. Cause I'd hear in the rooms, the group rooms, they'd be like hitting like a stuffed animal with a bat back in the day in 1989. And I was like, I ain't going to that thing. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, methods have certainly evolved in treatment, haven't they? Yes, yes, they have. Thank God. What is it that you think uh, led you into addiction anyways? I know mine's a, a trauma background. What, uh, what was it? When did you first really get hooked and start using any sort of substances? Well, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, the show used to always say, you know, it's, addiction is rooted with trauma. And I'd be like, what are they talking about? I mean, this was when the show started in 2005, six, seven. And I was like, what are they talking about? That has no, that makes no sense. You know, my dad was a fireman. My mom stayed at home. I was never physically abused, mentally abused, raped, nothing, nothing ever had verbally abused. You know, I had a great childhood. We'd go on vacations every year. Um, We had snowmobiles, we had a camper, we did everything that, you know, you could ever ask for in the American dream being bought up. And um, so I couldn't connect the dots on the trauma. And um, then I did some trauma training with a a dear friend of mine and my um, mentor, Judy Crane. And um, and she uh, helped me identify my trauma was even though at home everything was fine. The minute I walked out my door from four to 14, I was bullied. You know, I didn't really, I didn't know how to really walk. I kind of had a little skip to my walk, you know, very effeminate. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, (laughs) you know, kids could be, they could be a little cruel as, you know, the boys walking down the street, skipping instead of walking. Oh, cruel as hell. Oh my gosh. You want an honest opinion? Ask a seven-year-old how you look. (laughs) <laughs> yes, you'll get the honest right? opinion, yeah <laughs> so it was just torture you know every day i was scared to death that that was the day i was gonna die 
you know, as a four year old, you think it's death. And that was my trauma, you know, just scared for 10 years every day walking out my front door until I started doing drugs and drinking and smoking pot. And then all of a sudden I started getting friends and I was like, wow, this is even better. People like me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That falsehood. I, I know that all too well. When did you actually start using substances though? I think for alcohol, I think I was like, you know, 13, 14. And then, you know, I remember I was in junior high and my neighbor asked me, um, do you smoke pot? I was like, of course I smoke pot. Meanwhile, I'm scared to death. I just wanted a friend. <laughs> I was like, sure. <laughs> you like me, I'll do whatever you want. Yeah. And so he goes, okay, I'll bring some pot to school tomorrow. And the next day I stayed home sick. I was like, I go to school, <laughs> scared to death. Uh. <laughs> Then uh, the next day when I went, he bought it and I tried it and nothing happened. And, you know, the first time nothing ever usually does happen. And then say that's common, isn't it? Yeah, I think Same so. Right. I, I, I felt nothing the first time I smoked. But sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no. And then I was like, oh, well, this ain't so bad. And then the next time he brings it, I'm like, whoa, mm -hmm. <laughs> as, as all of our, our peers say in recovery, it's like, oh, this is really nice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to be afraid of anything anymore. I don't have to be in pain anymore mentally. This is really fun. You talked about, you know, your feminine walk being made fun of. Was it a, a fear of being honest about your sexuality? No, I didn't really. I didn't even know my sexuality at that time, you know, when oh. you're four or five years old. And then, as, sure. you know, I got older and you know, middle school, it would be like, I hated going to gym because I wasn't coordinated at all and I couldn't play sports. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're in line and everybody's picking their team and there's always that last person there, that was me. <laughs> right. So I'd be soaking wet in sweat, just my palms sweating, you know, oh, that nobody wants me on their team. Why am I even here? I, you know, I should, you know, so all of those emotions constantly every day. Oh, my God, I got gym tomorrow. And then, you know, when I was in puberty, I had breast tissue and there was a pool in our high school. So we had to have, you know, in gym, we had to go swimming. And I had, you know, and people would be like, why do you have breasts? And I was like, I don't know. I was like, <laughs> so I was so embarrassed to take off my shirt and go into pool. And so all of those you know, constant struggles of just being in my own skin and going out my front door was so painful. Yeah. Was that a form of, a, I forget what, what is a gynomastia, the often tumor that men will form in, in breast tissue and things like that that leads to male breast cancer? Yeah, it's, it says it's kind of common with males. And, you know, I never, you know, my dad has, I was like, dad, you never noticed it? Hello. I was like, how can you not notice that? <laughs> I was like, I noticed it right away in puberty. And I remember being at my mom's friend's house and I finally, cause I felt safe at home. Remember? Sure. And I was at her best friend's house and we were swimming in their pool and they're, you know, like their seven year old says, you know, like you said, don't be honest. He goes, how come you got boobs like a girl <laughs> in the pool? I'm like, what? <laughs> little shit. <laughs> Shut up. You little bastard. <laughs> I'm like, you're not supposed to say that. What are you talking about? And I, then all of a sudden it just adds to that, you know, that, that feeling less than feeling different, feeling, you know, all those emotions. And when you smoke a joint or have a drink and you don't have to worry about that, it's like, oh man, this is heaven. Yeah. Hmm. No, I, I, I know what you're talking about there. Uh, so when do we kind of start, you know, cause if, following you and, 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 and knowing who you are. And I really want to get into the book here a little bit and why you wrote it, but you're such a switched on man. It, it, why did, where did it really start to fall off the rails? You know, because you've achieved so much with whom you are now that it's still one of those like, Hey people, you don't believe recovery works. Ken's the example of it. And one of the many, many thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of examples. Uh, Millions. When, when, Millions. Yeah. When did it start falling uh, really off the rails? I mean, what, you know, it sounds like your your substance use escalated as it often does with so many people. Well, it started falling off the rails when, you know, like my parents didn't like my using. So mm -hmm. then as adolescents, you know, you're 
it, you know, I started hating them for not letting me feel comfortable in my own skin, you know, like, even though they did everything to protect me and they never harm me. And I had a great upbringing. I, I felt like, you know, they were always trying to, I don't know, micromanage and, you know, control my life because they seen something weird was happening. You know, they couldn't put their finger on it, but they knew something was happening. And so I would get really angry with them. And so at eight, 17, I signed up for the air force and they were like, you can't go to the air force. They were like, you have to be 18. And I was like, I'm going in three days after my 18th birthday, you know, just to get away from this. So I could be, you know, have my freedom, <laughs> right? <laughs> have that freedom in the military. That If you're looking for freedom, don't go to the military. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, Uncle Sam owns your ass at that point. <laughs> so I go in there and I was there for a year and a half. They, they stationed me in Italy and um, I, I was doing drugs over there and drinking. And they caught me and they gave me an honorable discharge. But after a year and like nine months, I got kicked out. Mm. And, you know, that was the first sign that something wasn't right. Like they sent me to the to the AA and I you know went to AA while I was getting prepared to be discharged. And I was like, oh, this isn't for me. You know, these are old people in this room. I'm only 19. What are they crazy? And so that was my first experience knowing that something isn't right. You know, something isn't right. It, yeah. I mean, you're really young. Where were you at in Italy, by the way, Aviano or? Uh, Remedy. Oh, Remedy okay. Italy. Okay. I bet you that's a very common thing for young people in rehab. Cause I was 21 when I was in and I felt the same way. I was like, I'm way too young to be in here. And I'm looking at all these right. other people that are in their forties, fifties, sixties. Hell, there was a dude there for meth pacemaker in his heart and he was in his seventies. And I was like, what the hell am I doing here? You know what I mean? Like, I'm just young and partying. What am I doing here? So I feel like that's a common thing for a young person in rehab. Mm. Yep. And, and what's scary in today's world, I mean, this was over, you know, God, I'm, I'm 59 now. So this was years ago. Mm -hmm. And the scary part for the young adult now that's 16, 17 and 18, thinking they're too young, you know, especially that now they're not even legal. Right. Right. And there, there's I'm too young. I, you know, I shouldn't be getting sober now. But what's scary is the fentanyl that's out there. Oh, yeah. You know, these kids are getting their hands on this fentanyl and they're dropping like flies. Yeah, we're seeing it because we're like we were telling you, we're just north of Fresno. And, uh, you know, we, we have a bit of a partnership with a couple of treatment facilities down there that really do a great job of, uh, you know, educating us. And, it, and it's I mean, the DEA has planted themselves in Fresno and this shit is killing kids left and right. You know, we're going to go to, to view a, a documentary where a mom speaks on it and her son was a good kid. Everything else was just curious. And I believe he would bl thought he was getting a Xanax or something uh, via Snapchat. And of course, the way they're mixing the fentanyl, it was 100% fentanyl. And it was the first or second time he had ever purchased uh, something illegally gone. Just like that. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. Mom found him foaming at the mouth at 6 a.m. in the morning. And, you know, it, it's it's scary. I mean, we've talked with so many guests. Ch Charlie Sheen brought that up. I mean, that guy, you know, he was on the, the edge of it all. But he goes, it's it's and scary it is in everything now out there and if you're using those street drugs understand it has that potential to be in there and you don't know at what dosage because we didn't have to worry about it you know what i mean when we were oh. doing joking stuff you didn't have to worry the only thing you had to worry about was not getting beat up by your drug dealer or not getting caught by the cops you know <laughs> when you're going to make a pickup you know but Baby we, powder fentanyl, yeah that we already knew that was in it that's why you shit all the time <laughs> when you're on coke yeah. but it was just like fentanyl was just so I didn't even think about it. Never. Right. And that's what if, and if, you know, your listeners that are listening to this and you aren't sober yet or not in the process of getting sober and, or even just, you know, there's that recreational use, then there's the abuse and then there's the addiction. So even if you're in recreational use, please go get fentanyl strips to test your drugs to make sure there isn't fentanyl in there. Because like you said, that poor kid, you know, second time buying drugs, you know, experimenting with it and they're gone. I mean, that's the reality. And we're, you know, the way I look at it right now is that we're going to get hit with a tsunami 
You know, the whole United States is going to be hit with this wave. I mean, it already started where I think 2019, it was um, 70,000 deaths. 2020, during COVID, it went up to 90,000 deaths. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine what the next three years are going to be like. Well, and, and, and if people don't believe you can, who works in the field, I mean, you've got your own treatment facility and us two knuckleheads, just look at the celebrities this last year alone, gone. And yep. all of it, they found traces of fentanyl within their drug supply. 5150 is power. The power to overcome. The power to persevere. The power to set your life on a course for success. When you're faced with the challenges life throws at you, you focus and do what is needed to go beyond what is required. So stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness knocking doors down along the way. We are 5150. Yeah, wasn't there those three comedians at all, you know, recreational using probably more than likely and all just from the fentanyl gone. And that's just the celebrities, but the everyday people, when you look at 90,000 people, that's 90,000 families. I mean, that's a lot of, you know, that's not a number. That's 90,000 families that are in so much pain, losing a loved one just for going out on, uh, you know, uh, who know, you know, whatever they're going out on either the second time of buying drugs or they're going out on a bachelor party and they decide to do a little bit of cocaine and they don't realize what's in there. I mean, it's scary right now. It's an effed up deal. And, you know, I don't know how I know I've lost a couple of loved ones with it, you know, the opioids and that was going on and that was scary enough in itself. And, um, you know, I thank goodness we're getting more stuff shed up, light shed on that area too. But now with this coming into the supply, which it's, it's been there, you know, we've, we've somewhat been aware of it, but now it's become rampant and how they're getting the supply of it into the United States from the East coast to the West coast coming down from the North, from the South, you know, it's, it's hitting uh, our our families and our kids, most of all, this is the one that, that seem to be getting the supply. Like you said, the 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds that are getting in that age range that are getting this supply of fentanyl because, you know, they're using whatever technology, just get it. I mean, I, I've heard they'll, they'll like cash app the dealer, leave it on the front door and there you go. That's not fair. We had to go to the sketchy neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> we, had to, we had to work hard for it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but nowadays, um, are you, have you guys been watching Dope Sick? I just started it on Hulu. I have not yet. Yeah, we're trying oh to God. speak with, with some of the writers, hopefully, about that or producers. Oh, please get them on there. You know, I, let me know when it is because I want to listen to that one because I, I've been watching it and it's how the drug companies pushed, you know, you know, the drugs on the general public. And how they were able to get, and, and then there was just that lawsuit, and I guess they got away with it or something, right? That's uh, my understanding. Yeah, I, I, that's what I understood is that they got away with it. There was no real consequence for you know having that agenda to be a multi-billion-dollar company for selling oxycotton, you know. And now, I think the United States has a pretty good hold on it with the way that they have to prescribe it, and you know. It's a lot more controlled than it was back in the, you know, what was it? The nineties, you know, early two thousands. But um, that's why I think we're going to be hit a million times harder because fentanyl is coming in from all over. I mean, in California, it's San Francisco, LA and San Diego, you know, China's bringing it into the two hubs up, you know, that that's what this season of intervention is all about. You know, I just, we just talked about it. You know, we had our first two uh, shows um, the last two Mondays. Um, So if you haven't seen it, it's all about fentanyl coming into California and family members like last Monday. Oh my God. You know, this family was affluent. They had money. They, they, you know, could have did anything. And their, their son and grandson was just dying from fentanyl. That was his drug of choice. And he was selling it. And that's where I'm scared is, if you think that epidemic was bad with the pills, times it by, 
I would say at least 20%, you know, times it by 20%. So if we're at nine, eight, 70,000, we're going to be at, you know, 140, you know, 200,000 deaths because the accessibility is you don't need to go to a, a doctor to get it. You don't need to go uh, get a prescription filled. You don't need the insurance. You don't need the money. You don't need any of that stuff. That and all is cheap. And it's growing fast in this country. I think it's our next wave of an epidemic. And I and people I don't probably don't even understand the origin on the creation of the drug. And as I understand it, it was for terminal cancer patients to ease their pain in, in hospice. So this was yep. like an end of the life drug. Yep. And 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 dope sick puts it perfectly. I mean, how they push that drug on people. You know, they, they push that drug on people like, oh, you know, they created new terminology, like breakthrough pain. Are you at that point? Breakthrough pain. If 10 milligrams don't work, let's bring, give them 20 to break through the pain. And if 20 doesn't work, they got up to 160 milligrams, you know, or some, whatever it was per pill. And they don't even have to do any of that right now. None of that has to be done. You just have to have a little bit of money and get in there. And it, all it takes is two tables or two grains of salt to kill the average person. Jeez. What are you seeing as far as with, with your facility, um, your uh, intervention 911, what are you seeing coming in with you, the, the community that you're most serving right now? Is it within the opioid community? Is it within the fentanyl community or, you know, just uh, illicit street drugs in general, alcohol? What are you really seeing right now as the most impact for the treatment that you folks are doing? I think, I think we're seeing a lot of these still the, you know, the alcoholic, you know, they're still out there, especially now with COVID, right? Everybody got to stay home and drink while they're working. Um, so we're seeing a lot of alcohol. And then we're also seeing um, fentanyl is slowly working its way in. And like, if you watch this season of that intervention, you'll really get to see that it's, it's like, it's not slowly working its way in. It's quickly working its way in. And what I'm afraid of is that before we get those people into treatment, they're going to be dead. Mm. You know, there's, there's no time in between. Like with alcohol, there's a long progression with alcoholism. You know, you start drinking and you turn into an alcoholic. You could go on for three, four, five years without having any major symptoms. Sure. But with fentanyl, it's just... Your tolerance keeps growing. Like the kid on the show this past Monday, his tolerance kept growing and he's, he, he was selling fentanyl and he was saying, I only sell it to people that I know their tolerance is high enough, you know, because I don't want someone to die from this. So I'm only selling it, you know, so they have the mentality and his tolerance was way up there. And, you know, and I was just texting him yesterday and he has um, five months clean you know, he's living in a sober living. He's completely different. I mean, thank God we intervened on this young man. Well, it's interesting. You, you know, you talk about that, that tolerance with it. It's amazing that he could even get a supply that wasn't killing him to even build a, a large tolerance, you know, because we had a discussion with a, a gentleman that, that we talked to and helps educate us that uh, it, about just the dealer mentality in general. And most of them aren't like this guy. They don't give a shit yep. who they sell to. It doesn't matter if it kills them, whatever. It doesn't make sense to me. Still to this day, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> like I was, I explained it to him and I explained it to Jason too. Like my dealer, it was consistent. I went to him every weekend. You know what I mean? He knew me. I knew him. I probably helped him buy his first Cadillac, you know? So it's like, why would you knowingly, unless he didn't know about it, but why would you knowingly put fentanyl in my shit if it's going to kill me? Like, why would you risk that budget, losing that budget every weekend? Why would you lose that customer? Like a barber, a consistent barber, for example, he f her up. You're never going to go to him again. If he kills me, I'm never going to go to him again. He just lost a customer and dealers are smart. Financially, they're smart because that's not easy. You know what I mean? So it's just kind of like, I just don't get it. And, you know, I think it's one of those things I guess I never will. I think for me, I used to sell crystal meth. So um, on, on the other side, and there's a lot of competition out there, right? Like when you're selling drugs, you know, you could go to the dealer down the street. You could go, you know, you always want to be the number one person that they call. 
to get their drugs from. And, you know, as a dealer, I get the mentality where they're, you know, if I only put a little in it, they'll get that extra rush that they're going to say, oh, my God, this is the best meth I've ever had in my entire life. I need to go back to Ken and get that drug. Mm -hmm. So I think that that that's the mentality is that they want to just put a little tiny bit in there. But what the normal like people that aren't don't have a tolerance, it's two grains of okay. salt that could kill you. Right. And so they don't, they're not chemists. They don't know. I'm not, you know, I wasn't a chemist as a dealer. I, you know, put a bunch of stuff in it, you know, and that was one thing I never cut mine. Like you said, with that, what did to get you to go to the bathroom? Oh, yeah. uh, baby laxatives, yeah. baking soda, <laughs> yeah. whatever's white, <laughs> whatever's white. That's why, you know, that it, not to jump off topic here, but on uh, horrible bosses where Jason Bateman accidentally does Coke when they're trying to get infiltrate on the one guy's boss, he says, be right back. I'm going to take one more quick dump. And like, cause he was all coked out and that, he nailed it to a T that's exactly how it is. So that's why, but yeah, no, anyways, back. So you would, you would cut your crystal meth before you would sell it or you would no, not. I, I mean, would, sorry, you would I not. wouldn't cut it because I wanted people to know, to come back to me, you wow. know, and that's why I wouldn't cut it because I knew that people knew that it was going to be potent. They knew that it was going to be good. And so I kind of get the mentality is they just want them to get that little extra you know, boost that they never had before that they think it's the best. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, and that's how every fentanyl addict starts is they get a little bit of that boost. And then all of a sudden they're like, I don't even want heroin. I don't want crystal meth. I just want fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And that's how they get, and you know, and that's what I'm scared of right now is we're seeing a lot of people, especially during this new season is a lot of people are addicted to only fentanyl. And, you know, there, there's been people like, and that's what's scary is they'll go to treatment and then they leave out and their tolerance level drops and mm -hmm. they do what their brain tells them. I'm supposed to do this amount to get this high. And then boom, they're gone. Yeah. They're and the gone. tolerance I mean, level drops quickly, doesn't it? Like it's not very, it's not very long. I had a buddy of mine who was a homeless heroin <laughs> addict and he went to jail. He was also addicted to fentanyl. And he went to jail for, I want to say about four to five days, came back, yep. smoked a little bit and OD and was in the hospital. Yep. So it's, it's quick. quick. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Do you, do, you, do you know any of the research on why fentanyl tolerance, then it drops quickly? And, you know, obviously all of us, I've relapsed with alcoholism and I went right back to drinking a, a, a 20 pack a day at least, or whatever it was. Why, what is it about fentanyl or that, that happens within the brain that you know there is that drop quickly is it a is it serotonin related i don't know enough about the drug of what actually you know the uptake is and what the reaction is yeah no what i've been told is it's just it's it's so potent that you know your your body can only take so much i mean like if if i did it right now because i mean you know, I was, I did an intervention. Um, this one isn't going to air for a while, but I did this intervention on this guy and, you know, he was like, um, he's like, yeah, I just carry around a drink and then maybe I'll take a couple of hits off a pipe, you know, of meth, but that doesn't even affect me. You know, that doesn't affect me. And I was like, so what you're telling me is your tolerance level is high and it does, you don't feel it. I said, because I guarantee you, if I even put alcohol on my lips, I'm going to feel it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. it's going to hit me at some level. And if I took a hit off of a pipe with meth, I'm definitely going to feel it. It's because my tolerance is so far down right now. We're not doing it in 32 years, you know? Um, so I think they're just so used to it. And now with the potency of fentanyl that it's just, it, it, it just takes them right out. I mean, it's so scary. And, and they think that this, you know, I'm grateful for, you know, Narcan and things to bring you back. But what the addicts are using that for is insurance that they're not going to die and they could push it to the limit. Where you are now may not be where you came from. The choices you make today may spiral out of control or spin you in the right direction. Discover a riveting true story of how Carlos Vieira nearly destroyed his life and lived to tell about it. Stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness. Knocking doors down along the way. And don't miss others telling their powerful stories on our podcast. 
visit kddmediacompany.com. Well, Ken, I want to know a little bit more about uh, Face It and Fix It. I mean, your book, uh, the wonderful title, a three-step plan to break free from denial and discover the life you deserve. What led you to write a book? What, why did you want to put it out? In addition to obviously, you know, as 12 stepper myself, you know, it's kind of like one of those living amends, so to speak, to put your knowledge out there. But, but what made you really want to write the book? Well, I, I think, you know, cause you're, cause like you said, uh, I, I'm also in 12 steps. I still have a home group. I still work my program. I sponsor people. I'm sponsored. I have the, you know, the, after all these years and, you know, to get into a 12 step, it's kind of hard, right? It's not, it takes that, that commitment of surrender to really, you know, I, I went to AA for four years while I was doing meth because I thought there was a problem and I, I just couldn't get in the door. Like I couldn't, I couldn't surrender. I was just like, I'm not like these people. They don't know how to measure it up. They don't know how to do a little meth or a little alcohol or take a pill. You know, they don't, they're not chemists. They don't know how to do this like me. And so I couldn't, (laughs) I couldn't (laughs) surrender. And so the purpose of the book was hopefully for people that aren't to that level that they feel like they have to surrender, there's a way that they could face an issue and then face the facts about around what's happening around that issue and able to fix it. I was trying to get people in the door before they had to hit that low rock bottom, if that makes sense. Sure. No, it does. And and, and I think so many of us, you know, it's, funny that you know that term rock bottom or what was your rock bottom and people always expect it to be so terribly extreme and it's sometimes it's just not like my mine i had a lot of bad shit that i happened was making horribly terrible choices and and definitely keeping my traumas going but it wasn't you know an insane rock bottom i didn't lose my kids i didn't lose my home i didn't lose my job but i certainly lot was on the edge to lose my my insanity you know and i was just absolutely powerless you know this using was my daily priority it was a plan you know and i think so many people that's probably a point you have to examine like if your day revolves around when you are going to use you got a problem so true right and 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 i was trying the purpose of the book was to try to get people in sooner than later but the problem ended up being, and that's why I don't think it was as successful as it is, is, you know, in all reality, every single person has to hit a rock bottom. And I don't care, you know, in the 12 steps, you know, the way I, I look at it now, I look at it a little different is, you know, every single human being that is in recovery, they talk about like at the 12 step meetings, and they tell their story, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today, right? Mm -hmm. And I always listen to the what happened because that was their rock bottom. And if you take that apart and dissect it, and this part's in the book, you know, if you take it apart and dissect it, you'll find out it spells out helps, you know, something with their health decline. Like I knew mentally I wasn't there all the time on the meth. I knew I was thinner than I've ever been. I was at 130 pounds at six foot. And I felt like my organs were dying. So I knew something physically wasn't right. So my health was deteriorating. My environment was shutting down on me, was getting smaller. And like I said, my environment now let me go from their job, from my job. I had to hide from my family. They lived in New York. I was in California. I could only call them when I wasn't totally twacked out. Right. And so my environment was shutting in, um, became very emotional, you know, ups and downs, crying, listening to a song on the radio. Um, then legal rock bottom. I was like, I think you guys mentioned earlier running from the law, right? Oh my God, I'm going to get busted. (laughs) I'm going to get thrown in jail for selling this meth. (laughs) So the, the legal rock bottom, is another one that gets people into treatment. Uh, And my finances, I mean, that was a big one. Like, how am I going to pay my bills? You know, my drug, selling the drugs kept my addiction alive, but it didn't keep my living expenses alive. I needed to work to do that. Mm -hmm. So the finances, and then the last one is your spiritual rock bottom where you drop to your knees and you just say, please help me. Mm -hmm. Somebody help me. 
So how did you identify your, your what? Mine was my, phys- my health was declining. My environment was declining. My financial was, you know, how was I going to pay my bills when I only knew how to, enough to barely survive keeping my addiction alive? So I, and, and then my spiritual one, I, you know, I really did just finally, when I was in treatment, I said, you know, I just cried out. I, I, I believed in some form of God, but I didn't really understand it because being a gay man and being brought up in church, it was like, mm. you know, look down at and, right. you know, I'm going to hell anyway. And, you know, I, I figured, you know, why would I um, look to that kind of God? And I even went to, you know, there was a 12 step program for, or I don't know if it was really a 12 step or a Christian program that worked the 12 steps of how not to be gay. You know, oh, I, there's <laughs> out there. <laughs> uh, Is that a thing? <laughs> I, yes. oh, it's out there, but whether, really, I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, that's, that. so that's so Isn't shitty. That's so that crazy. I went yeah. to it and I was like, cause I knew something was wrong and I was like, well, you know, it isn't my using, uh, you know, of course, <laughs> but right. I knew something was wrong. And I was like, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be gay. Maybe I'm supposed to be in church. And, you know, maybe that's why things don't work out, add up in my life. Right. So I went there, but I realized that I was only there looking for the relapsers mm-hmm. <laughs> that, would, that would hook up after the group. Right. Yeah. Right. It's funny you bring that up. I did a, a, a meeting out of town. And uh, I'm sitting there with uh, a buddy of mine. He's kind of like my co-sponsor. And I see the new guy and the new girl. And I tap him and I go, hey, watch it. That guy's going to go talk to that girl immediately once this inter- this uh, meeting is over. And sure as shit, he did going over there, you know, because people that, that maybe if they're tuning in that, that aren't, uh, you know, addicts themselves trying to understand from a, a family member to understand addiction a little bit well is that, you know, our substance use is just a masking of a bunch of other shit, you know, usually. And so it was like, I don't know why I could sniff that guy. Actually, I do know why, because I would have been that guy years ago. It was like, I could smell my own right now. So I even went and, and, and had a little chat with the gal, you know, a little bit. She's like, no, my friend warned me and, and I, you know, good boundary. And I was like, good on you, sister. Cause yeah, that guy, he just, he smelt it out, man. That's funny that you say that because, you know, I mean, how many people do you find that find detox love, right? Mm-hmm. They find their soulmate in detox and really all that is, I mean, if they're not digging into their trauma and finding out the purpose of why they're using, they're looking for the next best thing to make them feel comfortable in their own skin. Mm-hmm. So an orgasm is the next best thing. You know, it's, if I'm not going to be able to get high, let me have an orgasm, you know? And so that's why sex addiction is huge in the, in, um, when you're addicted, when you have an addiction, you know, that's a process addiction. Like I had 10 years clean. And I was sponsoring five guys. I was going to meetings all the time. I was working with my sponsor. And I, you know, secretly behind the scenes, not telling anyone, I bought a gun to commit suicide. And I was like, I don't want to live this way anymore in this pain. And I knew if I picked up drugs, it would be a slow, miserable death. You know, I'm too afraid to, you know. I don't want to be homeless. I don't want to be, you know, that slow, miserable death. So I figured the quickest way to do it is just shoot myself in the head. And then AA taught me seek outside help. So I went online. It was back in the o- the AOL days, right? You know, so oh, yeah. I got so <laughs> I see someone laughing. Yeah. laughing. I still have an AOL email. Uh Remember, you got mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you could see who's online or who's <laughs> taking a break or whatever. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, and, I, and, and there was chat rooms in there that were sex chat rooms. You know, you'd hook up with people in them. Mm-hmm. And I was in full blown sex addiction. Like if I only met my soulmate, I would be complete inside. And, you know, and if I only had a million dollars in the bank, I would be complete inside. And so I was fighting so hard to make a lot of money and to be, to get in a relationship. So even though I was sober and helping people get off drugs and alcohol, I was in these process addictions 
of what the next best thing would make me fe not feel myself. Because remember, I didn't work on my trauma yet. I was still thinking I had no trauma. And, you know, so I bought the gun and I made a plan with God. And I said, if the gun comes, because I got it on the internet, if it comes before I find help, then that's a sign from you, God, that you're telling me it's okay to kill myself. And I went out and I found a therapist and he was like, um, I, I had like, I went to like five of them. I finally found a one that I liked. And he was like, you know, you're in pure blood, you're in pure blown sex addiction. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, and one day you're going to go celibate. And I was like, is he really a therapist? I, I live in West Hollywood. I go to the gym every day. I'm 36 years old. I was 37 years old. I was like, I ain't going to ever go celibate. Hello. I was like, that's why I go to the gym every day. <laughs> and, um, and a couple of years later, working through it, I called him up crying hysterically. And I said, I'm ready to go celibate. And it was after a breakup, another breakup. So I was like, I can't live in this pain anymore. I can't do it. I can't be on this roller coaster. I'm ready. I'm ready to do it. And that was the beginning of my recovery for my sex addiction. Wow. How long was your celibacy? Three months. And then, um, well, I planned on doing it the rest of my life. Like any time that I had the urge to have sex, I, I mean, I wouldn't even masturbate. I would be like, I'm not doing anything. That's right. what and I was going to ask. Is masturbation part of it too? Are you allowed to do that during celibacy? Well, because no, that was... I've told you that was for, for me, it wasn't so much having a sexual partner, but it was, you know, mine's rooted in early pornography at a very oh, early yeah. age and sexual abuse. And so mine was no one's there. And once I acknowledge like, well, I don't want to hurt somebody else because I, I commonly, you know, there was someone that was looking to trauma bond with me. And so when I we're, we're engaging in, you know, physical intimacy, they're like, they're giving me their life and their heart in their mind. And they're playing that other side of the role of, you know, I'm going to fulfill them just like I'm expecting them to fulfill me. And it was so empty. And so it was like, okay, well, I'm not going to hurt anyone else. So I'll just, the internet, this is what they do for a living. No big deal. So during your yep. three months, there was no punch in the clown. No, nothing. Nothing. It was, it was and anytime I had the urge to do it, I would just say, okay, God, you're telling me it's time to meditate. Hmm. So I would just find a space and I would just go and I would meditate Yeah. and started meditating like 15 minutes a day. And then I brought it up to, as the years went on before, as I, when I, by the time I went celibate, I was up to an hour and 15 minutes a day. Wow. And every morning I would set my alarm. Like if I had to be somewhere at a certain time, I'd give myself an hour and 15 minutes to meditate before I had to get up and get ready to go to the whatever I needed to do that day. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> and so what, where was it again? Where then you said three months, did you decide I trust myself now and I'm not looking for someone else to fulfill me. I understand that their soulmates is bullshit. The only person that could be a soulmate is that, that man in the mirror. When did you decide and knew that you trusted yourself to, to try to date again? Well, I made the commitment to do it the rest of my life because I had so many sex partners. Like I, had, I, I tell Eric, I had to kiss a lot of toads <laughs> <You know>? yeah, <laughs> before I could find you. And, uh, but what happened is I really committed to the rest of my life being celibate. I hmm. said, you know, I've, I've had more sex partners. I've had more sex than most people have in three lifetimes. And I was like, I used up my quota, just like I used up my drinking quota. And right. so I, com I committed to it. And I was, and in that three months, I really felt like I don't ever have to find somebody to fulfill that void. You know, right. I'm going to, I'm going to live the rest of my life happy because in recovery, you have so many friends, you don't, you don't need to be in a relationship to fill that void. If I'm lonely, I could go to a meeting and go do fellowship after I don't have to have somebody living with me to fulfill that void. And after three months, you know, Eric and I went on a few dates in the past, but they were sexual dates. He was with somebody else. And, you know, and he, he saw me, he sent me an email and he said, Hey, I moved out of my apartment with my partner and I'm single, you know, you want to go out on a date. And I was like, I'm celibate. 
(laughs) 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 He goes, I was thinking more like a movie or dinner or something, but you know. (laughs) But okay. (laughs) Jeez, Ken. uh, I see how you look at me. Uh, Well, that's all it was about, right? It was like, how can you hook, how many people can you hook up with? How many times, you know? And like you said earlier, the, the more attractive I found them and I was able to, you know, uh, you know, conquer them, then mm-hmm. I felt loved, you mm-hmm. know, like, oh, if that one loves me, then I'm lovable. Mm-hmm. And, and so I kept going for the next. And then, and then as I found partners, I, they weren't really partners, they were hostages. Cause then I had to, you know, they had to read my mind to fulfill that void inside. And if they didn't do it the way my mind told them to do it, without me verbally telling them there was a consequence to pay mm-hmm. so, it was that vicious circle. And then, um, I called my therapist. I was like, what the f- do I do? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> he wants to go on a date. I can't go on a date. I'm celibate. I'm never going to have sex again. I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, Ken, it's a date. Just go on the freaking date. <laughs> I did. Were you really, you know, because once you get sober, it's one thing when you start to experience intimacy, but then when you really tackle the trauma period and everything else, it's that, that, that intimacy is so fucking scary. How did you communicate that when you started the relationship and were looking for a healthy relationship? Well, when it wasn't based on him fulfilling a void inside me, and it was more of the companionship and, you know, and we, you know, we dated for, I'd say like two or three weeks before we ended up having sex. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and then a week later he moved in <laughs> and, oh, you know, wow. and we've been together 17 years now. So I guess I it, worked. it worked out pretty good. huh? <laughs> right. Uh, two, two areas I'd like to know a little more about it is that, that vulnerability and, um, Oh God, the other one, let's start with vulnerability. Cause I just had a brain fart on what the other one, you said something really poignant that I could completely re- relate to. Cause you know, we're two men with sec- different sexual orientations with the same story really, you know? And it's like, I, that, that goes back to that uniqueness, our ego. I'm so unique and all my problems like, no, you're fucking not. Yeah, no, it's, it, it doesn't matter. You know, your sexuality, it doesn't matter. When you're going into sex addiction and you see it all the time, I mean, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of celebrities out there that, you know, go through sex addiction and you see like the people that they cheat on aren't even as attractive as their spouses. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so it isn't about it's just about that fear, that rush that we're we're craving that rush for um, wanting something more different, more, you know, and, and, and that's sex addiction. And, you know, I remember I went to the, I went to treatment with 28 years sober and, you know, because even though I'm in recovery, I mean, I went to treatment with 23 years sober for 11 weeks. I did a 28 years sober for like five weeks, you know, and because just because I'm off drugs and alcohol doesn't mean my brain is right. You know, I yeah. still have a lot of shit I, and, and hopefully till the day I die, I want to be able to look at this stuff. And um, when I went to treatment, I went in Pine Grove and they had their sex program there um, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And every Thursday night we would do a group, you know, with the people that were in this sex addiction program. And I fit right in because I, you know, I had sex addiction. And so I, I connected to what they were talking about. But the pain that they have, holy, have you ever been to a sex addiction meeting or treatment? I have not. No, I have. No, I've only done AA. I don't even know that there is any in our area. I've not really looked into it. I've kind of done more the uh, the work, you know, on my own or even with my sponsor. I can talk openly with him. He kind of had some some similar stuff, you know, that they went hand in hand, women and booze and drugs It all went hand in hand. So but I haven't. But I definitely have done a lot of watching of people's shares and stuff. There are so many great resources that are out there and available and people very honest And, and guests we've had on that have talked about it that have now become 
friends and I, you know, send them something and they're like, that's not your partner. That's your defect. It's talking. And it's like, you got to put that shit in check right now, because that's what I was going to ask you was about putting that defect in check. But, uh, we'll, we'll get to that after you share about, um, what you were seeing the people in pain. Yeah. It, I mean, if you go to those meetings and you're, and you connect that all, you know, I would, rec- I would recommend going to a meeting, you know, on sex addiction. Like if you're looking for the next you know, if you're looking for your soulmate in treatment, then you really need to go to these meetings. <laughs> you know, that's the first sign. But uh, it, even with a lot of, I mean, it took me 10 years, you know, don't wait like I waited 10 years to get into recovery around this. You know, I remember going to meetings and then I would go to sex clubs after the meetings and it would be like the second 12 step meeting. You know, I'd go to AA and then the sex meet, you know, we'd be talking about not drinking and using, but we were all in there having sex, mm-hmm. you know, um, but in those meetings, you hear the most raw shares you ever hear in your life. Because when we're on drugs and alcohol, you know, like the kid, the, the intervention I just did last Monday, the kid said, he goes, I didn't realize, realize I was hurting my loved ones, right? Because he's numb on fentanyl. I didn't realize I was hurting you all. And, you, and tears are falling down his face as he's saying it. And, you know... And with sex addiction, you're, you're not numb. You know how it's hurting your loved ones. And the pain is just so magnified because as you're going through it, there's no drugs or alcohol numbing it. And you're feeling, and that's why, you know, with gambling, sex addiction, there, there's a higher rate of suicide because you're not numbing it. With drugs and alcohol, you're numbing the pain. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely... Um... It, oftentimes that thing that you have to dig in beyond the substance, oftentimes there's so much underneath the layer, but, um, yeah, I want to ask you that you, you shared some really insightful stuff, but about your defects and, and really letting people know, Hey, we have to keep these defects in check. So what are some of your processes? I'm curious, even about your day, are we still doing an hour of meditation uh, every morning or, uh, you know, what does a day for Ken look like in, in, keeping Ken straight and moving forward? Well, like I said, I still do uh, 12 step meetings and I still have a huge fellowship. Like I just had a birthday last week and um, um, on Monday and a bunch of people, I mean, we just moved to Hawaii in February and a bunch of people um, had a barbecue on the beach with me from a, from our fellowship group, you know, and Sundays we'll go fellowshipping and hit different beaches around the island. So that's nice. And so I do that. Um, I go to a lot of meetings. I still do a lot of my home group meetings online, you know, to Mm. stay connected with the people that work in the industry. We do one every uh, Tuesday or every Wednesday and Saturday. Um, And then uh, for meditation, it's funny. I just had one of my colleagues, they were like, you need to have your astrology read. And so he had some woman from Arizona call me and, you know, get all my stuff. And she did my whole chart and she explained it to me. And, um, and she goes, you know, the reason why you're so good at interventions is you follow your intuition, Mm, you know, like when I was getting bullied, you know, I had to be able to read a room really quick. Mm -hmm. Like I'd be like, okay, that one could be safe. That one definitely isn't safe. So I had to read people's personalities really quick from four to 14. Mm -hmm. And so I had to tap into my intuition a lot to figure that out. And I use that as a muscle um, growing up through my trauma. So now I look at my trauma as a positive because it exercised that muscle. And and I said, I I know I have that in me. I know it's a gift. I know it's a gift. And we all have our own gift. And if you stay sober long enough and work your program, you'll get in touch with your gift. And I know that's part of my gift. And I said, I really want to learn how to fine tune it. And she was like, well, you got to meditate more. And I realized that in the last three years, I've been so busy working that I dropped my meditation and maybe I'll do 10 minutes here, 20 minutes there. And so now I just started it's this week I was talking to somebody and she goes and get some tarot cards. And I was like, I don't even understand tarot cards. What, do you mean get tarot? <laughs> what are you talking about? I know gypsy. You want me to be a gypsy now? <laughs> that makes three of us. 
<laughs> I don't get that stuff. Yeah. So she said, no, <laughs> yeah, I don't get it. Right. I don't get tarot cards. So I said, well, I do get meditation and I know meditation got me out of my sex addiction and got me out of my money addiction. And with my money addiction, I got to a point at the same time, the same few years where I, I, if I only had enough money in the bank to make me feel like I didn't have to worry about paying my bills, I got to the point where I said, you know, my dad was, you know, a fireman. So they retired with little funds and, but a retirement, you know, they have a nice home. They have, you know, everything they need and they have each other. And I was like, you know what? I don't need anybody because I'm not going to get in a relationship. And I could live comfortably in my rent controlled apartment in LA and I could live here the rest of my life. It's a two bedroom apartment. It's $800 a month. I'll just live here the rest of my life. If worse things happen, I could go to Starbucks and I could, um, you know, work the counter at Starbucks and pay my rent. I was like, I don't need to make money. And once I surrendered on making money is when my career started happening. It's so weird. Like I, I had to let go of making money in order to make money, if that makes sense. Yeah. Geez, that goes to show how long ago that was for a two bedroom, $800 a month in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like 3000 oh, yeah. yeah. for a studio. <laughs> uh, it's been, well, that's interesting. You say that we've heard that from some other people and that's an area I still struggle on. I might even email you for advice on that of letting go of the having to make money and it ends up panning out better. Uh, one other area, Ken, I, I know we're, we're running short on our time that I want to touch on though, before we get to our fun random questions and, and kind of leave you with the last words, but uh, spirituality, you talked about going, you know, to one where it was like, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to trivialize it to make it comical, but you know, we're going to pray the, the gayness out of you, you know, come here, you know, I, how did then, because of being shunned or going to church and hearing that, that like you said yourself, like I'm going to hell anyways, because of my sexuality. Uh, how did you then reconcile that with yourself in seeking your spirituality? Um, I think it was for that was, um, was, uh, is that, you know, what was happening is, you know, I always believed in a higher power. I always believed in God. I always believed in Jesus. And I was like, you know, um, and, and when I was in those dark times by myself, I was afraid to tell my parents something was wrong. And so I could never tell them something was wrong. I, I didn't want to hurt them. And so I would cry myself to sleep and pray. Mm -hmm. And so that always bought me some form of comfort. So I tapped back into that when I got into recovery from the 12 steps, I went back into that where I knew like um, there was something out there. And as the program teaches you, you know, if you don't believe there's a power greater than yourself, I mean, I'm surrounded in water with nothing around me, go out and try to stop a wave, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to be able to stop a wave. There's something out there that's greater than I am. And, you know, all the stuff recovery taught me kind of brought me back to my original spirituality before I'd had the judgment around it. That's awesome. Uh, Ken, we like to do some fun, random questions and leave you with some last words of inspiration and encouragement. Um, uh, fill people in a little bit more on uh, uh, intervention as well as uh, intervention 911 before we get to that. Yeah, intervention. I mean, the TV show, it's still, I mean, I can't even believe it. It's on its, you know, 23rd season you know, 23 seasons now and um, still going strong. I mean, the numbers are still good and a lot of, you know, people still watching it. Um, and, you know, it's helping millions of people. That's what I love about the show. And Intervention 911 is still going well. You know, we have a lot of people all over the country. I mean, we train people to become interventionists and case managers because that's why I think treatment doesn't work mm. and we're getting a low success rate because, we, we're missing the intervention on the front end and we're missing the aftercare on the back end. Mm -hmm. And so the CCMI certified case manager interventionist trains people to be an interventionist and a case manager. So if you want to learn how to work in the field, there's a lot of people that get sober and say, I want to work in the field. This is a great credential for you. Jump in and get this credential. It's the, you know, 
Or if you're, you want to do side work and you're a therapist, you know, we give, uh, we give CEUs for therapists and, um, and you want to kind of take a, a semi-retirement where you don't want to be in the office all the time, but you want to go still help people. Mm-hmm. You know, you can learn how to intervene and in case management and create your own schedule. So we've been training all kinds of people, you know, for over, I think we're going in our 14th year of training with Intervention 911. And then our center down in Palm Springs, every single person that comes to our center gets an intervention on the front end. Even if you're a self-admit, we bring the whole family system in like a regular intervention. And we want to case manage you. We have a, um, a meeting with Edna because insurances aren't paying for the aftercare. Mm-hmm. And we got to do something about that because Edna is one of the first that are doing it. Um, but we really got to do something about the revolving doors of people yep. in and out of treatment. And just having somebody follow them would be a lot cheaper than readmitting them. Yep. But you could follow them for a year for the same price that it would cost to readmit them, you know, three, four, five, six, seven times. I mean, even one time would pay for the year. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I love it. I love the work that you're doing. Uh, Uncle Mikey, random questions. You're up first. Good, sir. All right. This one isn't so much fun, but it's a serious question. You ready? I'm ready. (laughs) Would you rather fight one horse sized chicken or 10 chicken sized horses? (laughs) That's a good one, huh? I like the chicken chicken sized horses. Little horses would be a lot easier. (laughs) You just punt the little bastards, (laughs) right? One peck from a horse sized chicken. I mean, goodness. Uh, right? God, that's all it would take. Knock out your whole brain. Boom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we we were actually talking about this question last time with the guest. And um, chickens can run around with their heads cut off for a little bit. Forgot about that. Yes. So if you find a weapon, which that wasn't part of the question, but if you did find a weapon and cut its head off, that would still be right. <laughs> I didn't think about that. That's terrifying. Right. I told you it was a serious question, Ken. Uh. <laughs> I, I don't uh, like the 10 little puppies and little horses. I don't mind those. I can eat deal with puppies. I kind of right. feel like they'd be adorable. Right. Oh. Yeah, right. Oh, look at these little horses. But, you know, when they're trying to attack you, it's different. Yeah, but. This is true. They're, they're pissed off Broncos. Uh, Ken, uh, any pet peeves? Just what shit that irks you? What really irks me is in this industry that I work in, um, people don't stick together. You know, there's a lot of splitting and a lot of backstabbing. And that just, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going through that a lot right now. And, you know, because I, I'm fortunate enough that I've been on the show for all these years, there's a lot of people that'll just want to attack you. Right. And we're all, I mean, I work 24 seven trying to save lives. I'm always trying to figure out a, a way to help save a life. I'm still very active in my treatment program. I'm doing trauma eggs with all my clients. And, they come in when they never talk to me, they don't know me, and they just start attacking, you know, and it's just heartbreaking. I mean, it, it's not even working a program. I don't, I don't get where their sponsors would even allow that kind of behavior. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is really sad when, you know, people because, hey, what's one of the things we do is take a look at our defects, you know, and ask for them to be removed. And here it is, you know. We're just trying to make sure people live out a life that they realize they can contribute to society. And it's just, you're just going to have a shit attitude. And yeah, it makes no sense to me either. Uh, Mikey. If you were stranded on a deserted island. Not as nice as the one you're on now. <laughs> if you, I am. Yeah. I am right there. <laughs> but you're not stranded and it's a beautiful view and you got all of that, Ken. I don't want to hear it, right? You're in Hawaii. <laughs> but if you were stranded on a deserted island, and you could only take with you one album and one movie, but you had, you know, a TV and a CD player and electricity. Which would it be? Ooh, that's a hard one. One movie. Um, well, I really like that one. Um, what was that one with uh, Bradley Cooper and uh, Lady Gaga? A, a Star is Born. I love that movie. Mm. I love that movie, right? Mm. That would be probably the movie. And then... Um, you know, for an album, I probably would go back to my old days and grab one of the Led Zeppelin albums. Oh, you nice. can never go wrong getting the Led out. You know, my only beef with A Star is Born, and mind you, I didn't see the first one. Who was in it? First um, two. 
There's two. I didn't people. see him. I didn't see either Chris, of them. Chris Christopherson. Yeah. Um. When I first saw it in theaters, Bradley Cooper started off like in the truck or whatever before a show, and he was pounding the bottle. I already knew how it was going to end. And I had yeah. never seen the first two. And that's my only beef that I had with the entire movie. It's like the first scene already shown me how it's pretty much going to end. And I was right. I, I didn't know how he was. It's not a spoiler. Movie's been out forever. If people get mad at this and get over it. Uh, I knew he was going <laughs> to die. I just didn't know how he was going to die. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I knew he was going to. And he did. And I was like, I knew it. And I love Bradley Cooper. And Lady yeah. Gaga is a phenomenal singer. And it was just like, that's my only beef with it. But yes, great movie. <laughs> Love Led Zeppelin. Who the hell doesn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jason, you're up. Absolutely. Well, Ken, uh, we so appreciate this. It's it's been a pleasure to uh to speak with you and glad that we were able the way we were able to connect. It's just hey, that one of those things that works out. But uh if you have any words of encouragement for either uh those in recovery or have yet to seek recovery or their loved ones, what what might that be? You know, it's interesting because, you know, people that are out there still suffering, you know, they're going to stay out suffering for a long time. And it really takes their environment to take the first step. So anybody that I hear like that, what was it that created their rock bottom? Like when we talked about that earlier, Hmm. you know, it was something from the outside that motivated them. So if you have a loved one that needs help, don't wait for them to ask for help. You know, call an interventionist. There's thousands of us out there, hundreds of thousands. I mean, there, we have people trained all over the world. We started training in Europe first. So mm-hmm. there's people trained out there that could help you if you have a loved one that's struggling. Don't do this alone. I mean, I just had somebody tell me today, she went through my training and she was like, I'm so glad I talked to dad into taking away the kid's car. And I was like, no, you don't take away the car. Because if you take one thing away at a time, they get used to living without it. So mm-hmm. it's really about taking it all at once. So it's that punch in the gut where they say, okay, I'd rather get help. So get a professional involved, ask for help, and don't let your loved one die. Please don't, as, as long as they're alive and breathing, please reach out for help. Ken, thank you. This has been an honor and a pleasure. So nice meeting you too. Yeah, thanks for your time, Ken. This was fun. Appreciate it. <laughs>